defeat the non-conformist oath. I promise to be different. I promise to be unique. I promise to be unique. I promise not to repeat things other people say. So the the film entrepreneur rise of the film film entrepreneur your 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 new work um, and it's really it's more than just a work it's a philosophy it's a it's a way of life it's a business model it's like all these things wrapped into one that right. it's not for the faint of heart man oh no this is this is not this is not for uh for the hobbyist this is not for someone who's just like hey i want to make some pretty pictures i want to make some movies like no this is this is look it's the same thing as this man and this is where filmmakers fall so into these deep holes a lot of filmmakers jump into the business just what i'm like i just want to tell some stories i want to be an artist that's great and that's what that's called being a hobbyist that's someone who does it's equivalent of me picking up a guitar, learning how to play it, and then g- taking a gig here or there at a coffee shop, but I'm not making a living with my art. That's what that is. That's not what this book is for. This book is for someone who's serious, who wants to build a career, build a business around their art. And, but it's, it's work. It's no question. It's oh, yeah. work. No, but, it's- that's what, but that's what a business and a career is. Yeah. I would, I would argue that it's, it's more work than the traditional route even though the traditional route is, you know, we talk about how it's broken. Um, but man, just, just thinking about all the things and, and you really left no stone unturned. You, you investigated every angle. And the, I think the best part about it is because you've done all this stuff before and you figured it out as you were going along, you sort of tripped over all these things going, Oh crap, that works. Um, and other people can use it too. Now, there were a couple of things that, that I, as I was, I was like, I'm too lazy to do that. I'm like, I'm too lazy to do all of that work for a movie. Now, let me just, let me just ask you this one question. So with your film entrepreneur approach to things, mm-hmm. how do you, let's say you have this script that you really want to do, but mm-hmm. it's not going to work for that way. You know what I mean? Do you just shelve those things and do things like write specifically for this method? So what is, okay, so, so let's analyze that. What is the story of this script? Like, what is this, 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 is this a passion project? Because look, if it's a passion project and it's something that you're like, I wrote this script, this is the script I want to make. Like I have scripts that I've written that I would love to make mm-hmm. and, but they're very expensive. They're, they're not cheap movies to make. So unfortunately, you and I have chosen an art form that's extremely expensive. This is an expensive art form. So unfortunately, the realities of the world are that I might write the next big Marvel epic and I have my own Avengers script that I would love to make, but with my own characters in it. And it's only going to cost me $100 million. Unfortunately, that is not realistic. So regardless if you have a passion project or not, you've got to figure out how to get it done, whether that be bringing the budget down or attaching certain talent or going after a certain niche or positioning it in a way that it can be done. This is the reality of this business. And this is not what a lot of people like to talk about. This is not the fluffy stuff that they're, they're taught in schools. It's not the fluffy stuff that Hollywood puts out. You know, like I always say that Hollywood's great at the sizzle, but it's really bad at the steak. You know, it just it shows the 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 Holly and I always use. I think I told you this the Hollywood Boulevard example. Yeah. Like when you when you watch Hollywood Boulevard on Oscars, it looks great. But if you actually ever visit Hollywood Boulevard, it's you, crap. You know, it's yes. a scary place. Yeah. Um, that's what this. That's what these kind of ideas that have been floating around for decades is about. This is not a. This is not a fun conversation to have with an artist. I've had this conversation with filmmakers, and they get upset. I'm like, dude, I. Don't shoot the messenger. This is just the reality of this is the reality of where we're at. I'm not saying can it happen? Of course, somebody could find some money and you could blow up to be the next paranormal activity or mm-hmm. it could blow up to be the next Napoleon Dynamite or one of the other 
five or 10 examples that yeah. are outliers in lottery tickets. But that's just not the reality of this business. It's the equivalent of me opening up a beer, a, a brewery, like, you know, a craft, a craft brewery you know, place. I have no idea about, but I really want to make it. And I just need, I don't know, I need two, $3 million to get the factory up that, you know, the, the, I, I don't even know what it's called. Some sort of factory to make all the beer the out. I don't even know because I don't drink. But um, <laughs> but you know what I mean. It's yeah. the equivalent of me. Like I have a business idea and I want to do that business idea to a really high level, but I've never done a business before and there's no real way I know I'm going to get my money back for it. But that's what artists do. Yeah. So unfortunately, we're not painters. Unfortunately, we're not musicians that we just pick up a, an inexpensive you know, uh, relative speaking, an expensive instrument and play or write music, even writers. I mean, writers is just cheap. You need a laptop and some software and you're a writer. That's why everyone's a screenwriter. I'm sorry. Or pen and paper. If you really want to cheapen it. Down. I mean, if you want to go, if you want to go old school, you do that. You get that typewriter and you start typing away. It's very affordable to express yourself as a, as an artist that way. But we have chosen a very expensive, one of the most expensive, um, mediums in the planet. Yeah. So I, so we've, we've already started, we shot a third of our bottom feeders film already. Nice. Con by the way, congratulations. On Thank that. you. We got all the exteriors done and I, and, th and then I listened to your, your I'm audio sorry. <laughs> and then I'm starting to rethink everything because, because I'll be honest with you, we went, you know, we didn't obviously go the film entrepreneur route. Um, you know, we had a script, we were, we decided we were going to put as much money as we can of our own money into it and then try to find the rest and also try to get, you know, people to work at, at a reduced rate and try to cut deals and all that kind of stuff. And so we're basically looking at, we have to shoot the, the rest of the movie and we're not really sure how much money we can get. We're not, you know, there's like, well, it could go this way, this way, or this way. So now you've got you know, this option, this option, and this option, and how the film's going to be. Um, it'll be the best it can be either way. But, and I, so I started thinking and I'm like, wow, how can we, how can I apply these techniques to what we have left? And I really, it was really difficult and I really came up short. <laughs> but I have to tell you, there was one, I took, I don't want to say took issue, but I, I laughed out okay. loud in yeah. one, one of your, one of your examples. When you're talking about using, you know, named stars, named uh, yeah. actors, and you're like, if you if you're gonna get, if you want to get so, uh, someone to come to Buffalo, New York, in the middle of winter for two thousand, I did that for you. I did that for you. <laughs> I swear to God, when I wrote that, I was thinking of you. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna do a little shout out to Scott on that one. <laughs> oh, I I screamed. I was like, ha! Ah! That was so funny. I'm like. It's only a thousand. It's not two thousand. <laughs> Jeremy's coming. He's coming to Rochester to, to shoot a day. I think he's got three words to say. Right. <laughs> In all fairness, his his uh, because of our budget, his the original role that he was cast for was cut. So we had to find something else for him just to keep him in the film. Um, but I was laughing at that because I'm thinking. He's you're you're so right, and it, it, it's such a difficult thing when you when you play in that catch twenty two. Like you need money to get a name, you need a name to get money, and then you just run around in circles. And then you go, well, oh, the script's good enough without a name. The script, you know, our our local talent is good enough, and that could be true, but nobody's gonna care because they're not gonna watch it because they don't recognize anything. Well, the the relevance is this, man. It's not about talent. See, a lot of a lot of filmmaking, unfortunately, right. in today's world, it really talent is irrelevant. <laughs> I, I know it's a very rough thing to say, and of course you need talented people. Of course you need good actors. But what I'm saying, like, if it's bad actors, it's not going to work. But you can find local. Un There's so much talent out there that is untapped that no one's ever seen before. But in the media landscape that we're in, right, called the new film economy, it is irrelevant. It is absolutely irrelevant. If you have a really great story, uh, you know, I've been, wa I've watched, I just watched a, a handful of these uh, small independents that are great movies, but 
they're not getting a lot of press or a lot of attention because there's just too much competition. Yeah. It is not the olden days of the 90s and the early 2000s where you could stand out with a really great movie. And look, at the end of the day, the cream rises to the top and all that stuff and fine. But on a realistic, pragmatic way of looking at things, it, it's almost irrelevant. So that's why the only power you really have to penetrate the marketplace is niche, is to connect emotionally with a group of people. And if, if that is within a, a tribal sense, meaning it's something that they believe in, whether it's religion or politics, or if it's something they're passionate about, like skateboarding, surfing, or being a vegan, you know, um, something along those lines. That is what really connects. That's what will cut through all the marketing, all the hundreds of million dollars that Hollywood is doing. It's the only hope we have as independent filmmakers to make any noise. Uh, and it has to be brought down to a much smaller, like you're becoming a microbrewery where a lot of, and I'm going to use a brewery thing, you're becoming a microbrewery as opposed to being Budweiser. And most independent filmmakers go, I've never made a beer before, but I'm going to open up Budweiser right. as opposed to like, I'm going to make one great craft beer. And I'm going to focus that craft beer on people who just like this kind of beer and then grow from there. It's, it's the, you know, the ego and the horse and the cart and that whole thing. So tell me about how you factor in SAG into this whole film entrepreneur model, um, trying to use named actors and, and things of that nature. Um, in my experience with what we were doing, SAG really mucked us up bad. So we mm -hmm. ended up going for non completely non-union because we had one person that had joined the union and we couldn't afford to do it by their rules. Of course. So I'm going to just give you an example of, uh, of a filmmaker who I had a similar scenario and it's a, it's a, it's a, a case study in my book. I don't talk about the SAG aspect of it in the book, but uh, the movie for lovers only. Uh, for Lovers Only was a movie with, uh, directed by the Polish brothers, Michael and Mark Polish, who are established directors who've done studio projects and things like that. And they went out and uh, hired Stana Kadic, who is uh, who was the star of Castle, uh, the TV show Castle. And now she's on an Amazon show and she had a very huge fan base. And she's obviously a SAG actress. Mm -hmm. And what the boys did is they made this movie for literally zero budget. If, if you read in the book, they made it for no money. They did not work with SAG at all, but the movie eventually went on to make over a half a million dollars. And then SAG came calling and they basically told SAG, sorry, um, I didn't sign a deal with you. I, I'm sorry. And they're not going to punish Stana because She's making $50,000, $100,000 a week on Castle. So they did nothing. But you know who did do something? The DGA. The DGA went after them because they were in the movie, but they acted as the producers and they didn't work within the DGA's rules. So they had much bigger problems with the DGA than with SAG. So there's two ways of going about it with SAG. One, you can uh, you know, if you're making a micro budget movie for two, three, four, five thousand dollars, dude, come on. You know, just you know, you're basically doing an experimental film. Sure. So you're going out there and seeing what happens. So you go, you you shoot some stuff, see what happens. After the movie is done, go to SAG and go, hey, look, we shot this thing. We really didn't know if it was gonna even work out. You know, how do we how do we get, you know, in good graces? And at that point, and we, we paid you pay everybody the same rate that you pay everybody else, you know, that what's what's re required then after the movie is done you go back to sag and talk to yeah them. see that was the problem that we had our film being ultra low budget um which is anything under two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and that's the lowest thing that they have yeah because they because they they can't understand a movie being made for five thousand dollars <laughs> it is not in their model they don't want to deal they don't, they don't want to de they don't understand they don't want to deal with you know, some Yahoo's making a movie for five grand. That's the way they look at it. You know, I'm one of those Yahoo's, by the way. You know, I've made my movies for like five, six grand. The problem so. we had was that the actress that we had cast didn't want to ruffle the feathers and sag because she was newly, you know, newly joined. And you cast somebody else. Yeah. 
you, you well, bottom line you cast somebody no you cast somebody else look you got to work with people who are willing to work with you at this point in the game look this is what we're going to do if you're if you're scared of the union and you're scared of sag and you're scared of what's going to happen look we're just trying to make something happen here we're not trying to abuse you we're not going to do anything you know we're everything's on the up and up here we're going to pay you what they're going to pay you if it works great we'll get on board we'll we'll sign with sag make sure everything is taken care of after the fact films get done like this all the time sag is too small of an organization to track the tens of thousands of films being made just in the u.s alone every year yeah so it's not anything against sag but at a certain point there has to be you have to have i mean look if you're making a movie for five grand does it make sense to spend five grand on like putting money in deposits and all this it doesn't make any sense you're now hindering the process you're hindering trying to make a movie so if you uh, there's two ways to go. if it's a really really low budget go out shoot some stuff see what happens if it happens then go back to sag and ask if it's a big a little bit bigger fifty sixty thousand dollars use their ultra low budget or use their experimental i don't even know what the contracts are and work on it that way uh but either way there is a way to work with it but it just depends on your budget if your budget can't handle it then either not don't use sag actors or use sag actors who go, will understand the process that you're working with. Like, look, let's just get this done. Let's get this yeah. in the can. And then afterwards, let's go back and, and let's work with the union. It happens all the time. By the way, the Polish brothers, they never worked with SAG. Um, that, was just, that was a closed case. And that was a, that was a very public half a million dollars they made off of that movie. Mm -hmm. and, and SAG really didn't do anything because they, had, they didn't sign a deal with them. So the only person that was in trouble was was Stena, but you think they were going to do anything to Stena? No, of course not. That right. was, you know, they're making, it's, a, it, it, it's just a weird thing, but, you know, and don't, and forget about DGA or WGA at, at, at the low budget. You shouldn't be working with those unions if yeah. you're at, at, at the micro budget level. Um, we had, we had some union things happen here in New York um, this last summer with a film that was, was shooting here called Drunk Bus. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you heard about it. Probably not. But um, basically, there was some hijinks, some tomfoolery going on with the budget. And so, I, I, I one of the IATSE or one of the local unions had to had to jump in and flip it. So, and then it shot it. That. And then they went and shot, you know, in some podunk town with a bunch of scab crew and everything and it was just a disaster so like things that have been happening around here and everybody that was the one thing when you get to a certain level in filmmaking at least around here people start getting all crazy about unions and sag and they they i don't know if it's just a scare tactic because they want you to be frightened and not try but it's just like you think that as soon as you finish your movie do. there's going to be these you know dudes in black coats and trench coats that are going to come and say yeah we're with sag see you owe us 50,000 g's see but the thing that that's not the way it works yeah. if you if you sign if you sign a deal with the unions uh, or you use union people you've got to you know either work with the people that you're working with or work with the unions uh, look you know at a $50,000 budget if you got IATSE running on you i mean that means there's just nothing there in the in the market because i mean i remember working in florida where there was a million dollar, I'm not, I'm not crapping, a million dollar movie that I was doing post on. And the director was shooting on a mini DV. This is a weird story. They were shooting on a mini DV Panasonic HVX or DVX 100A mini DV camera. IATSE showed up because they had everything. They had these, you know, trucks and everything. And, and there was, they were using non-union, but IATSE showed up and they, and they looked at the camera and they said, yeah, we're, and they just walked away. They just walked away because they knew there was no money, or at least they thought there was no money. They didn't even think that a million dollar budget would use such a, a crappy camera. Yeah. But at the time it was either that or film and they wanted to go with the film look, right. the, the, the mini DV look as well. Wanted to get that 24 uh, P video, baby. That's right, um, baby. I remember uh, that camera when that came out. We all Yeah, watched. man. <laughs> I, that's when I shot my first short on, my first big short on, it was great. Yeah. But yeah, so, you know, Look, sometimes you've got to be a little bit of a pirate on this situation. You know, you've got to, you got to do a little pirate uh, of filmmaking. You know, I shot an entire movie at the Sundance Film Festival without anyone's permission. I just ran around with a crew of three people and I shot an entire movie. And it was, it, it, it's fantastic. It was great. So it all depends on 
how you do it and where you do it. And there's always ways around things. You know, I think, first of all, I want to get back to your book because we're, we're starting to talk about more my crap than your crap. And your crap is why we're talking about crap. If um, to begin with. Um, <laughs> how long did it take you to actually physically write the book to like get it done to at least to send to an editor or for a first draft? Like how long did you have your nose to the grindstone? It was pretty quick, man. I, I, I really cranked yeah, it out. I about six weeks, six, seven weeks. That's, it was, that's great though. That's great. It, it just, was just, I just started writing and like the, my first book took a year. So shooting for the mob took about a year to write because yeah. it was much more emotional and it was just a whole other thing. Yeah. But this was a technical book. So I, once I sat down, once I had it outlined, yeah. just basically just chapters, I just, just, I was writing about a thousand to 1500 words a day. And when I sat down to write, to write the distribution chapter, I was only going to have one or two chapters on distribution. It ended up being 15,000 words. Then the whole distributor thing came up right. while I was writing it. So I was like, ah, oh, I got to finish that up. Now I got to put that in there. And then I added, you know, the predatory, the predatory film distributor chapter and all those things. But it, it was a really quick write for me. And it was, I mean, this was, I basically started this out in the summer. I think when I launched filmtrepreneur.com and the podcast, I had already started to outline it. I was I had the book on pre-sale before I started out. I finished writing it. Oh, that's so it was on pre-sale in, in July go. because I was like, that's a great, that's a great way to put uh, pressure on. Yeah, you get, it's a great motivator. I got to get this done or I'm going to be in trouble. Uh, yeah. So with, uh, with all that you're doing with, with your Indie Film Hustle TV and the Film Entrepreneur and all the podcasts and, and everything that you've got going on, um, tell me how you, how you organize your day. How do you organize your time on a daily basis? Because you've got to be disciplined or else you'd never get all this stuff done. You've got yeah, to I, I, I feel like I'm, I, I don't feel like I'm disciplined. I feel like I'm hard on myself, but I wake up every morning around 4.15 to, uh, to go to the gym. I work out, come home, get, get things ready, uh, probably do a little bit of work, maybe 30, 40 minutes, then get breakfast ready for the kids, get them off to school, come in, uh, and then just start working on my day. Each day is a little bit different uh, depending on the day. Some days are batching uh, podcast episodes, other days are uh, doing interviews uh, and other days are creating content for IFH TV uh, other days are writing so if I'm in the middle of writing a book the first hour of the day will be dedicated to just writing mm -hmm. so um, you know like right now as we speak right before we I got on here I am now finally putting my nose to the grindstone on getting the shooting for the mob audiobook done uh, and it, because now I've got the first audiobook done I'm like okay so, I, and yeah. that's just, it's just much more emotional for me to go through that story, but I'm yeah. doing that now. So I'm now pounding through that to get that done because every, a lot of people want the audio book. They want the audio book and the I response do. from this book. Yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> you really, you, it's one thing to read shooting for the mob, but it's another thing to hear me tell the yeah. story with me oh, doing the voice. Yeah. 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 No, that's me doing the voice of Jimmy <laughs> and me doing like characters in the, it's like, hey, it. Kid. Yeah, I do. Hey, kid, how you doing? Kid, like I do the I do voices in the story. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I do that, and then I I clock out around six o'clock, and in between there, sometimes I'll meditate between a day, an hour to two hours a day, uh, sometime sometime during the day, and uh, and I'm just I'm just constantly pounding it. So it depends on what projects I have on my on my table right now. So I just try to knock out things in order deal with email deal with i do consulting so you know I, I schedule in my consulting in there as well and just you know just just dealing with things little by little i try not to leave my office i'm a, I'm a hermit so i try you know for me to go out into public uh and take a meeting is a big deal just because i've got so much work to do mm -hmm. so uh but i do take meetings every once in a while for you know business meetings and things like that but other than that, I'm, that's what I do, man. I just, and I grind it every day, but I, like I say, like, I think I said this in the book. It's like, if you love what you're doing, yeah. you know, I love the, I love the grind. I love the grind. It's, it's now, I can't live without it. I really can't. I love being back here, you know, weekends as much time, as much as I love work, live, you know, being with my family. I, 
I miss the routine. I want, you know, I want to keep working uh, because I get so much satisfaction out of it. Do you have a home office or you have a? Yeah, this is, this is my back. This, this is my, I have, a, I have a, a, a back house. So this is my back house. Cool. Um, that, it's funny that you, you brought up um, meditation because that's one of the things that I wanted to see if you were into because I know that in my experience with the different successful folks that I've talked to, uh, meditation is like the cornerstone of their productivity. Yes. So no I was question. curious about that. What, what, uh, how long do you think you meditate on a daily basis? Generally, a daily, daily between one to two hours a day. Really? And uh, yeah, every day, at least an hour, at least an hour every day. Um, uh, you know, my attempt to do it weekends are a little tougher with the family, but, sure. uh, but generally speaking once a day, one hour a day minimum, and then uh, sometimes two, if not my record, I think is five and a half hours in a day. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just wanted to, well, you know, you must have yeah, had crap going on there. Yeah, it was, um, the thing is, is when you meditate it, for me, a lot of ideas fly into my head during that time. A lot of, uh, questions that I have, uh, I have questions I need answers. The answers will fly into my head, uh, during that meditation. Uh, it is, it is a cornerstone of my creativity. Uh, a lot of the things that are in this book came through meditation. So, you know, I, when I wrote this book, I was almost like a conduit. It, it just kind of just completely just exploded out of me, it vomited out of me. It was, I was just, I couldn't, I couldn't stop writing. I couldn't yeah. stop writing. It was such a, you know, it, it was so much information. And I still like, after the book is done, I can write another 30,000 words right now and add to this as a second edition right now. Like after the book, I finally gave it in and did it. There's been so many events that's happened since then. So many other ideas, other stories, other things to elaborate on the film entrepreneur method that I'm already, I'm already thinking about the sequel. I'm already thinking about what the next book is going to be. I already have my next two to three books in my head. So I'll start writing that probably after the new year I'll have, I'm so my goal is going to be do, to do at least one book a year, possibly two. Nice. And, uh, and they, w and they will be self published. The first book was published with the traditional publisher and this one's self published. And it makes absolutely no sense for me to go with a publisher. Uh, it not, just, with, it, not with your reach now. You you definitely no, self publish. No, again, if it's if it's a large, it's one of the if it's one of the top five guys in New York, and they are going to get me into a lot. I mean, get me a lot of press and and raise my exposure and all that kind of stuff. That's a different conversation, and we can talk about it. Then that, that we're in the Gary V world at that point, and uh, I'm open it. to that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm open. I'm open to that conversation, but yeah, exactly. generally speaking, exactly. Yeah, like I always say, I'll take the meeting with Marvel. Just uh, Kevin, just call me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the meeting. I'll take the meeting just for the mere fact to just at least come back to you guys and go. So this is what happened. <laughs> this is what it's like when you walk into Marvel Studios to take a meeting. So that would be uh, like I've I've said it a thousand times, and I'm I'm putting it out into the ether. I'm putting it up, Kevin. I'm. Anytime I'm ready to take that meeting. But that stuff is in cinema. <laughs> I know, Marty. I know it's not cinema, Marty. I understand. I understand. It's not cinema. Sorry. No, I, no. Uh, look, look, we, look, we, look. I, I, let's just, I'm going to put, I'm just going to say something about that right now. Martin Scorsese can say whatever the hell he wants. You're absolutely right. He is a master. He is a living, a living master. There's no question about it. Um, He's one of the greatest cinematic directors of all time. Do I agree with his statement? No. Cinema is cinema. It all depends. Look, if there's an emotional, look, I don't know about you, but at the end of Endgame, I was fucking, I was crying. I was, I was tearing up with the whole, sorry, spoiler alert if no one's seen it. There's something that really happens bad at the end. I haven't of, seen it. You haven't seen it? You haven't seen Endgame? I Jesus. haven't really. I don't. I, I haven't seen really many of the Marvel Marvel movies. Okay, well then, but they, but they have an emotional. You know, a lot of people get a lot of emotion out of those films. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and who's anyone to say what is impactful to me is irrelevant or not cinema? Right. No one is the guardian, or no one is the the person who says what cinema yeah. is. It's an opinion, like anybody else. Speaking of cinema, ego and desire. 
Yes. Corner of ego and desire. You're you're feeling that. that that's just being released. Um, what is that? That coming out on Amazon Prime? Yeah, it's going to come out January twenty first, twenty twenty. It's going to be available on Prime and Apple TV, but exclusively on IFH TV. You will get director commentary, wow. behind the scenes documentaries, and then additional course uh, coursework around how I made it exclusively on IFH TV. So you'll be able to get that as part of the membership or if you want to do a, an outright purchase. Yeah. Hey man, I got to say, I totally forgot about my, uh, my subscription and uh, what do you know? It just, it went off. I was like, Oh, IFH TV. Oh yeah. I forgot about that. You're number two. <laughs> well done. Um, Thank you, sir. So, so that, that's the film you, you mentioned it earlier that you shot while Sundance film, the Sundance film festival is going on, people going mm -hmm. crazy, running around and you guys are with the camera shooting stuff and nobody, you know, nobody knows, knows the better. Oh, I, shot, I, I shot, I shot in Sundance headquarters, two scenes, two full scenes at Sundance headquarters. Like I didn't, you've got to be a pirate, man. Like we're, 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 we're in this, you, when you're low budget, micro budget, you got to be a pirate. So no, let me tell you something though, uh, or my opinion on that is I agree. I am all for it. Um, you have to also have a crew. Like you've got to have yes. you know, pirates because I want to go and be a pirate and I got a bunch of other guys that are like, I don't know if I want to be a Done. pirate. No. Nope. You know, nope. that's the hard part. Nope. That's the hard part. You need a crew. You need a crew who is as crazy as you are. And look, when I was casting for On the Corner of Eagle and Desire, uh, I met a few actors out here in LA and they were just like, oh, I can't do that. I'm going to get arrested. And I'm like, well, this is not your movie, dude. So I needed to get, I needed to get, you know, three actors who were crazy enough to go on the journey with me. And I did with Sonia, Rob and, and Randy. And these guys were, uh, they were just game. They were just like, I'm, I'm whatever you want to do. Let's just go do it. And I never had an issue uh, with, with anybody, including my crew, which was small, but still, you know, I had my main man, Austin, who's my DP um, and um, my audio guy and a friend of mine, Straw who uh who came out and just did anything i want him to do uh it was great it was just a great experience we shot in 36 hours i think it was total amount of of filming time it was and shot over the course of four days while i was doing interviews for the podcast <laughs> so it was uh it was a wonderful experience one of the greatest creative experiences i've ever had but if you don't have a crew who believes what you're doing it, it's not going to work and, and especially cast if your cast doesn't understand or is not willing to go down this crazy road with you, then it's not going to work. And you've got to recast to somebody who is willing to, to go out and, uh, and, and, and do the, the pirate thing. You know, there's uh, there's, you see them on, on Facebook or whatever, these memes and they're, and they're, they go around where, you know, one of them says you can't pay your bills with exposure. Or something like I saw one. No, uh, the best. I got to stop you. The best comment I ever heard about exposure Dying was, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, yeah, D Daniel Knopf, uh, the creator of Carnival. He's like exposure. People die of exposure, and uh, I just thought that was the greatest line ever about that. Exactly, but see, that's the problem that a lot of us run into when we want to do this pirate slash gorilla filmmaking approach and we want to let's just run out there let's just shoot you know and i and i know how how much how scripted was that was that a, a, a scriptment or was it very it was a scriptment it was scriptment it was scriptment and then uh, the cast and i sat down and worked out i actually we filmed the whole thing it's going to be on ifh tv we we actually worked out some of the story beats some of the things because i i, I laid out the whole i wrote the entire uh outline of the of the movie so i every scene was written by me but then inside we're like okay what are we going to do with these characters here how are we going to do that and then while we were shooting things would just come up you know and then i would i would throw them lines the stuff that they came up with uh, ad-libbing was amazing especially sonia uh my lead in the movie she the stuff that comes out of her mouth you just want to like i can't <laughs> even believe that anyone would say things like that. that's great um but yeah it was great well that that's sort of what I'm getting at is that the no go ahead no 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 you just I was I remember I was going to answer your question so the yeah. reason why you have issues with trying to go do the pirate thing 
the, the like when I first did my very first short film, um, which was called Broken, this little short film I did in 2004, 2005, it was an extremely ambitious project. It was, it was, you know, a hundred visual effects shots, action, nobody. And the, the only thing I had going for me at the time, so I was, I was young, I was still, I think 29 or 30 at the time. And what I did was I had an office, I had a post-production suite. So I did my casting in this studio that I had rented. So there was a sense of legitimacy to me. Wow. I had no public, no one knew me publicly at that point, you know, and, and the, there was no barely any social media at that, at that point either. So I, I didn't have anything to leverage. The only thing I had to leverage was my professionalism and the work that I had done prior. So I would show any, any potential people I was working with, I would show them my commercial work, my editing work, my directing work that I had done. I had directed other things. So that was the legitimacy that brought these people along to come do that pirate thing with me because that was a pirate situation as well. It's extremely ambitious. But I also built the project up to a way that it was so, it looked so ambitious. So I was marketing to my crew. I was marketing to my cast. So I had, um, I had concept art done. I had behind the scenes, I had walkthrough videos. I had, I mean, I had so many things that are associated with a big budget action movie that people that jumped on, they were just like, well, this guy, I mean, I just got to see if this thing's going to even come, is it even going to make it? <laughs> so that was the way I started. Now, because of my track record, my, uh, my street credibility, it's a lot easier to, to call up three people who I've never heard of before, never met before and say, Hey guys, I want to cast you in my movie. It's going to be shot at Sundance. We have no permission to do anything. We're just going to go out there and gorilla the whole thing. And uh, we're just going to have fun. And at the end of the day, you, this movie will get seen by a lot of people and it will get exposure, you know, and you won't die from exposure, but it will get exposure. You will be paid something um, minimum. And uh, what do you think? All they have to do now is go to IndieFilmHustle.com and all the credibility I need is there, but it's taken me years to build that. So that, I think that's the problem with a lot of filmmakers when they've never done anything and they want to go out and do something ambitious. You have nothing to prove that you can get there. You have nothing to prove that you can actually do what you're saying you're going to do. So that is the big key. So if, if you're trying to go down this road, filmmakers should really start building, like, you know, like when Robert Rodriguez started out, and he did El Mariachi, which was a very ambitious thing. He had his friend and he had like 50, 25 short films he did that no one had ever seen. And this one short film that was an award-winning short film he did at school. And that was it. No one really knew what he was doing. His friend, his best friend at the time, which was the, the lead. And then between the both of them, they just had relationships and they leveraged their relationships. But then after El Mariachi, everything else changed. <laughs> I mean, you know, 25 short films, that's... I know that because I have, you know, what, 10 short films or whatever under my belt. And a short film, even if it's only five minutes long, it's still, you know, that's still what hell. You finish something. It's, you finish it, something. It's finished. It, you know, you went through the whole process. And, you know, it's, it's like night and day when you, when you jump on to do a feature just because, why wow, we've been shooting for, for eight days and we're still not done. <laughs> There's something wrong here. Um, I was done. I would have shot you know, six of my short films in eight days, but we, you know, the, the leveraging of, of your past work, I, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. It's all about, it's all about marketing. So you need to understand how to brand yourself mm -hmm. because you're not new to this game, dude. You're not a kid. You know, you haven't just, just came out of film school and you're wet behind the ears. You've shot before you've done things. It's about how you present yourself and you need is a website. You need a good website that is well designed, well polished. You build up, you, you know, you exaggerate things that might have happened a little bit. You fake it a little bit till you make it. And, you know, and that's what you do. What do you think I did? When my first edit reel was completely bogus. So all I did was grab all, the, it was complete bogus. So this, I, I, I've told this story before publicly, but I'll say it here again. My first editing reel. I worked at a commercial house in, in Miami and one day a bunch of European directors, they just 
signed to represent like five or six big European directors. And all of their movies, uh, not movies, all their, their commercials and footage came over in like a big FedEx overseas box. I opened them up and there was just this gorgeous footage that just looked like, I mean, just all film, of course, because it was all filmed back then, all 35. It looked like stuff that Fincher and Bay were shooting. It was stunning. So what did I do? I grabbed that footage, re-edited fake commercials with it, slapped on a Nike logo at the end of it, or slapped on this other logo at the end of it, put four or five of those together, and went out as a, as a freelance editor, yeah. and, faked it to, and faked it till I made it. Did I, did I edit the, the commercials that they saw? Absolutely. Their assumption that I was associated with those brands is on them, not on me. If they asked me, did you work on Nike? I'm like, no, no, that's a spec spot. I never lie because if I lie, you're going to get screwed. Right. But if their assumption, if they don't ask that, so that reel was so good that I didn't change it for two years. Yeah. I had done real commercials. <laughs> I would occasionally add a real commercial or a real spot that I did, but the other one, they were so good that I just, you know, because I, I never had access to that kind of, that kind of budgets again. In my head. I did later, but not early yeah. on. Yeah. So, You've got, you've got to fake it till you make it a little bit. There is an element of that. So if you create a larger than life image for yourself online, then people will, will look at you that way. So, I mean, you've got to just think about marketing and branding. I've been doing that since I was, you know, since I was a kid, you know, I did a whole episode on how I changed my name legally, you know, when I was 18, you know, cause Ferrari wasn't my name in high school. So and I did it for branding at 18. I knew that. Yes. A lot of people don't know that, but I did an entire episode. I talked about personal branding and I changed my last name legally. It's not too far off from what my real name was, but I changed it at 18. Cause I went to high school with you and I, I, when I saw because your- it's so close because it's so close to my real, my original name that you probably never even noticed it. So, but it was, it was changed. And I changed, changed it not because I have a <laughs> I changed it not because of a fetish for Ferrari because I particularly don't you know I, I don't I mean I'll take a Tesla um I'll even take a nice I'll take a nice Prius so I'm not a I'm not a fan of Ferrari but for whatever reason that name stuck in my head for the longest time I thought I was going to use it to be like an NFL star could you imagine a wide receiver Ferrari down the down the line <laughs> Like, could you imagine that would be an awesome name when I was going to be a Miami Dolphin wide receiver and oh, Marino was, and Marino was going to throw me those long uh, bombs, Marino. but uh, Marino. So yeah, I, I had my name legally changed at 18. As soon as I turned 18, I did. Um, my parents weren't happy about it, but it was just something I knew that I needed to do. And that last name has helped me so much in the course of my career for branding. People would remember my name in a list of editors, they would pop me right out because it just stuck and be like, I want to talk to this guy, you know, just because of the last name. So that's personal branding. And I did that. I mean, that's an extreme version, but that's who I am. And that's what I wanted to do. Version. I'm going to go back to my yearbook and pop that open and see what the hell your name was. Cause it's what you're, you're right. It wasn't that far off from that. Cause no, I, it's not. Cause when I reconnected with you, I didn't see any difference. I was like, Oh, Okay. Yeah, I, I did it. I literally, I came out with an entire episode about personal branding and I just laid it out there because before I would just be like, I never talked about it, but I just said, you know what? I just got, I think this is a lesson to learn here, man. I'm not telling people to go out and make, you know, change their last name to something, you know, Porsche or Lamborghini or something. Lamborghini. But for me, yeah, but for me, it made, it made all the sense in the world. And it has been one of the best decisions I'd ever made in my career because it just works. Um, it's just an, you can identify that. And when you think of the name Ferrari, what do you assume? Quality, speed, power, all of these things that are associated with that brand. I was able to attach that to my directing or whatever I was editing or whatever I was doing. And this was honestly not like, I wasn't this deep into it when I changed my name. I was like, that's a cool name. I just want to be yeah, you're 18 years old. You're like, I'm, I'm 18. Don't think at 18, I'm sitting down with this analysis in my head. At 18, I'm just like, that's just a cool name. And I want that name. 
with the what's the market and it's been ferrari because i'm kind of yeah, i did I mean, ferrari and uh and jaguar and Camaro is a pretty cool name too I mercedes mercedes yes uh, alex mercedes no but um but yeah it just it just was a name that stuck in my head for years before that but that's that's personal branding so that's i think what's something that you need to to really think about not changing your name but um yeah but that's really for that. but um but to to rebrand yourself on on your website and and just look you you're a you're a bigger fish in a small pond brother so you know you have you know you were similar to me i was a i was a i was a bigger fish in a small pond in the miami fort lauderdale area broward area uh in, in south florida so i was able to pop myself out a little bit by doing some good personal branding uh it's a lot harder to do that here in la because there's just so much more competition yeah. but if you're able to build a lot in your small pond like i did so when i showed up 11 years ago i didn't come in with nothing i had reels i had websites i had movies done i was you know i had an imdb list you know there was a lot of stuff i showed up to la with and that's how you do it to show up clean you know it's a little harder but doable let me tell you anyone that buys the all the inventory out of a hollywood video has got my attention <laughs> <laughs> I love yes, that you, story. That's one of the great, that's one of the best uh, side hustle stories I've ever heard in my entire life. It's so perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, when, when this, when, when this film is, is out and, and, you know, the ego and desires is, is doing what it's doing. What do you think is going to be your next, your next project? Is it going to be a film are you gonna? Are you you got a film possibly that you're gonna work on because you've got so many things right now going on and mm -hmm. you know for me when I think about making a movie I'm I I have one way of thinking about it and your book has kind of shown me that there are just are so many ways to think about it ways that like give me a headache there's so many ways um, but it's brilliant it's it's really great stuff and I think there's a lot Thank of people you, especially younger people coming up who are way more savvy in the ways of social media and that kind of, cause it's a way, it's a way of thinking that not a lot of people, at least my age, our age, you know, in the Gen X, the upper end of the Gen X is I, you know, a lot of them can't think that way. Like they, it's just impossible, you know, like it's yeah. like it's beyond them. Yeah. Um, and it, look, the realities are if the, the, I was at AFM this year. I went to AFM this year. I spoke at AFM this year. AFM is the American film market for everyone that doesn't know what AFM is, where movies are bought and sold internationally. It's one of the biggest markets in the world, one of the top two. And I, while I was there, I came to the realization that one, after talking to so many distributors, after this whole distributor thing that happened, the whole debacle of distributor um, happened, I got the opportunity to speak to all the distributors. And I, I, at one point I asked one of the distributors, I said, you, you guys really don't know what's working, do you? And they said, no, no, we, we basically try to acquire as many titles as humanly possible for no money. And then we throw them out through our system and throw, up, throw them against the wall and see what sticks. You know, the key is to build a giant library up, but they don't know what's going on. And at that moment I realized that there were half million dollar, million dollar movies with stars that had zero market value. That had zero market value. Uh -huh. And I just, it, 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 was, it wasn't surprising, but it was at the same time because it is the reality of where we're at. And, you know, I want filmmakers to think, anyone listening to this right now, if you don't change your thought, pattern if you do not change the way you think about making movies you won't make it because this is exactly what happened in the publishing world and it happened in the music industry and now it's happening to our industry it's a devaluation of media M music used to cost 17.99 for a cd for us to buy a song or two when you and i were in high school that's what it cost right you, like you know, one or two songs on the whole album you had to buy the whole album or right and then it had a single out you know and even at the single, you're still paying three, four bucks for the single, right? right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. 
So that was the cost to acquire the media. The, the, not the studios, the labels, the labels controlled the access to the music you wanted. Then something called MP3s was invented. And when MP3 showed up, then all of a sudden, the value of, of music was free. You could download it for free. And it was so instant that I could download the entire catalog of the Beatles within 30 minutes. The entire catalog, their entire life's work in 30 minutes for free. It's, it's that easy. So then the, the music industry fought back. They started suing people for downloading on Napster and stuff like that. They, they did all of that stuff. Yeah, they were trying to fight. This. They were trying to fight technology. They were trying to fight what was inevitable. It was just going to happen, but they kept fighting because they wanted to hold on to the status quo. Same thing happened to Blockbuster. I have a whole chapter. I will have a case study and don't be blocked. Um, because they're trying to hold on to the to the to the golden goose. They're trying to hold on to wi- the way they're making money. So then, what happened? They're in disarray, and then someone called Steve Jobs shows up and goes, "Hey, look, guys, I've got a I got some technology here called the iPod, and people are just downloading music for free and putting it up there. Uh, you really can't you really can't fight piracy. You can only compete with it. So you got to make it easy enough for people." to get the music they want, access to the music they want, and they'll pay for it. And he's like, everything's gonna be 99 cents now. He's like, they were like, what? Wait a minute, how about albums? Albums are gone. And if you don't like it, good luck to you. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. So that was the first step of the debate. So now something that costs $17.99, now costs 99, or free, depending on how you look at it. Then they took it a next step further, and they created something called Spotify and Apple Music, and Apple Music, where now for 10 bucks a month, something like that, you have access to all music. So now each song is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a penny. So there's no money anymore in the sale or exploitation or the, or the access to music anymore. It's very, the, the money's just not there like it used to be. You know, these millions and millions of dollars that were generated by the music industry and by artists is gone. It's gone. Whether you like it, don't like it, it's irrelevant. It's gone. So now what do, now what, what do musicians do? Where are they making their money? Touring, merch, sponsorship, access to themselves, meaning um, meet and greets, photo ops, autograph sessions, and, and all the other things, merches and sponsorships and touring. That is where they're making their money now. The music is given away for free. They put it up on YouTube. You can listen to it for free. They put it up on Spotify. They make no money. They make merely any money off that. So their mentality had to change for them to survive. That is what's happening in the film industry right now, where now you can get access to all movies through one of these many streaming platforms and the streaming words are coming up. Or you could go into the boot into the black market and bootleg it off, you know, download it through BitTorrent, you know, and that's piracy is always going to be a thing. You can't stop piracy. You just can't. It's just too large. The internet's too big. So now, as in the, we've been taught is if you make a movie, the only way you can make money with that movie is to sell access to that movie to exploit the access that you can get to watch that movie, whether that be theatrical, DVD, Blu-ray, cable, airplane, you know, cruise ships, and streaming. That is what we were taught. And you have to go through a distributor to do that. Well, those, that's not true. That system is broke. It is breaking down around us. You could see it at AFM this year. You could see that there was less distributors out there that the model is changing nobody knows what's going on and now streaming has dropped the prices like apple i mean apple uh, amazon just literally dropped from six cents an hour of streaming that they would pay you on amazon prime to a scale from one cents to 12 cents now so on the on the lowest end which is where a lot of movies will live they'll pay you one penny per hour streamed. wow it's one, so basically a 90 minute movie, you're making 1.5 cents. And I don't care if you see it. I mean, if it gets screened a million times, great. But every half cent that you go up could be thousands of dollars. 
So it's, and there's a, I did a whole episode on the reason why they did it and how you can hack it a little bit and, and get a better chance to get, make a little bit more money. But we're talking now about pennies. Mm. We're fighting over three cents, four cents, as opposed to when the DVDs were going on, everybody was making millions of dollars. When Blu-rays, and everyone was making millions of dollars. In the old system, everyone, but that system is dead. It's gone. It's just gone. So if filmmakers don't get on board with thinking differently about how they make movies, they just won't survive. And that's okay. You don't have to listen to the film entrepreneur method. You don't have to think like an entrepreneurial filmmaker. You don't have to. It's no skin off my back. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to show you what's happening. And the only, in my opinion, the only way independent films are going to survive is being entrepreneur, independent filmmakers, is to be entrepreneurial, is to be a film entrepreneur. And if it's, you know, is there always going to be the outlier? Yes. Is there always going to be someone who goes, makes that little wonderful art house film that, gets blow, that blows up? Yes. But they're becoming less and less, you know, popular because it's just too much competition. There's just too much stuff too going much on. Too much noise. Yeah. So it's just, it, it's, it, it's a reality that is a hard pill to swallow, especially for people of our generation. And, and the new kids coming up, they're much more open to it because they don't know any better. But for people who knew what it was like in the olden days, they're just like, this sucks. I'm like, yeah, it sucks, but it's the reality. I, I don't care which, it's the same thing that was said from film editors when Avid showed up. Ah, this sucks. What is this digital crap? Great. The same thing that film, film uh, DP said about film when Alexa and Red showed up. You know, it's just, it's just what it is. You yeah. can't fight it. You've got to adjust, pivot, and adapt. If you don't, you will die. It won't work. You won't make it. And it basically means that if you want to make a living making movies, you got to really actually work harder. And you have to wear more. Oh, because to- it's never been easier. It's never been easier to make a movie. Right. The, the, bar- the barrier to entry used to be the production of the movie. In the 80s and 90s, if you just made a movie. And now. <laughs> everybody and their mother can generally, and there's so much education out there and so much technology out there, affordable, that anybody and their mother can make a feature film, a series, anything like that. It's just, it's just so, and now the access to being able to put it up in the marketplace is also been dropped. The big, the, the big difference is now you need to understand how to make a business out of this. Because before the old system was, the only struggle I have is making it. Once I make it, I can hand it off to somebody and someone will pay me for it. That, that, that system is broken now. It's gone. It's gone. It doesn't exist. Even right now, it's, it's, that doesn't really exist anymore. Okay. It really so- did. So here, so let's, let's, let's take me. Uh, there's gotta be some people out there that, that have my situation right now. And, and we'll, we'll close with this because you know, I'm eating up all your day, your whole day here. No, no, I, I'm fine. I, I've set I've set five hours aside for you. So, so whatever you want. <laughs> so let's say, okay. So for our bottom feeders movie, we've already, we've already kind of committed to the older style of, putting let's just round it to fifty thousand dollars in and trying to get some sort of you know trying to go the festival route trying to get it into you know to get it picked up by a distributor or get it into you know netflix or or whatever so we're we're already a third but here's the thing we're already a third of the way through that we did not start using the film entrepreneur idea you know that method we didn't start it that way how does it get picked up from here? How do you pick up the pieces What's and the story? Tactics What's the story? In the middle. What's the story? The story, the story? The story is two guys that are struggling to hang on to their college life. They're about to age out of it. One dude li- lives in his mom's basement. The other dude likes to, likes to date high school girls, and it's just their, their fun times. I mean, it is okay. a college comedy. So it's a college comedy. Okay, so that's fairly broad. Um, is there okay? See, I've 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 so, my brain and I can't find a niche to this. In okay, this. I have a niche for you. Okay, <laughs> the niche that I would uh, uh, on something like this because of your because of your status in your community, I would go after the regional cinema model. I would use the regional cinema model for this. 
the reason why is that you can't compete with other college comedies. You just can't. If there is, if, 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 it's a, if it's a competition between watching old school again or watching bottom feeders for the first time, most people are going to pick old school. No offense. It's just, it's just the way it is. Okay. So you need to, you need to find people who you can have an emotional connection to. And the only people that you can connect a film like this to emotionally is your local community because you have a presence in your local community. So it's, it's local boys do good. Come out, support local, the, you know, local filmmakers. And, and be, between your radio show and between everything else that you do, you can galvanize your local community to do this. You can go to the local theaters and say, hey, guys, this is who I am. Let's, let's put this in here. Yeah. Let's do some screenings. You don't have to pay for four walling. Try to partner with them 50-50. I promise you, you'll get a lot of response. Then you do a small theatrical run in your area yeah. where you now make it an event. This is not just a screening. This is an event. You're going to have T-shirts. You're going to have merch. You're going to have stuff that people are going to want to buy. Why? Because they want to support you. Not particularly because of the movie, but they're going to support you and what you guys are trying to do. That's the story you've got to sell to your local community. Yeah, that's the I mean, only that's way what, you really That's pretty much what we're doing. That that was our, okay, good. our approach. Um, you know, we were trying real hard to get local, like Three Heads Brewing, local brewery. You know, we got them to to give us all of their empties and signage and shirts and hats and stuff to put in the movie, along with a little bit of scratch to help with the production cost. Um, but you know, they're local local heroes in the in the micro brewing yes. arena. So it's like right. And you can also leverage, you can also leverage their audience for the movie. So you talk to them and you go, let's do a strategic partnership. They have an email list. Great. That's the email list that they're going to send out for the screenings. They're going to sell their beers. Let's see if you could figure out a way to do a screening. If it's not in a movie theater, maybe in a, in a hall or something like that, where they can actually sell their, their beer there, make it an event. Make it a, you have to create an event style thing. It's, it's a, and I have a chapter on that in the book called event style um, screenings or you know, event screenings. That is going to be your only hope. You've yeah. got to really do stuff regionally, partner with people in the community, which you seem like you'd be doing already, and try to get the budget down as low as humanly possible. Get it down to a ridiculously low budget because, you know, if, if you're going to spend an extra 10 grand, is there an ROI on that 10 grand? That's, you have to, you have to look at it like a business. If I spend that extra 10,000 bucks to make this movie, am I going to get that $10,000 back or can I just make it for 40 and maybe save the next 10 for marketing or other things or merch or whatever else that I could do yeah. to feed the business? You know, you have to ask this, you have to ask that question. Like, do I need the crane today? How can I make this? How yeah. can I make this without the crane? Will it will it affect the story that much more? Will the audience go, man? I wish I had that crane there. Yeah. Like, is it yeah. is it gonna, that? And that's that's hard for a filmmaker because we are oh, artists. We're already, we're already shooting as bare bones, like freaking. You know, we made we made things two shots just because it was easier to do the scene as a two shot rather than going back and forth and getting multiple angles. And that's still, I've got 15, I've got 10 to 15 days of, of shooting to go. Mm -hmm. Well, can you drop those 10 or 15 down? I, I would love to. I, I would love to. And, I, and maybe I can. Um, you've got to figure, you've got to figure out, you got to figure out how, how much cheaper you can get this into the can. So yeah. I, like drop, just start slicing and dicing to the point where, it's starting to get stupid. As long as you can create a minimal viable product, that is what you have to look at. You have to create a minimal viable film for the marketplace. What is the cheapest I can do that while still maintaining a quality, quality level that the consumer is going to enjoy? And the regional cinema model, the event screenings, the strategic partnerships, that is the future of what you could do with this film. And, and the cheaper you make the movie, the better chances you are to get your return on it yeah. and also you have to you also have to ask yourself the question what is your end game here is your end game money is your end game exposure is your end game what is that because there's a very different 
out, outcomes for what you want. Yeah. Some people just want to make this and go, I just want to show that people show people that I can direct. If so I make some money, great. Yeah, we want to make these all the time. Like we want to start original business. movies from here all the right. time. And I don't, we don't care if they're like, you know, everybody's heard of them, but so, if we can make enough money to pay off our investment and live and to make another movie and not be scrounging, that's what we'd mm -hmm. like. That's our, you want to create a, you yeah. want to create a film entrepreneurial business, sir, is what you're saying. Yeah. No, exactly. It's 100. So there's, so I'll tell you a perfect example. There was a, a, a guest that I have, he, I just recorded him. He's not on the show yet. He's going to be on IFH TV in a few days. Uh, early, but his uh, his story is uh, he's a filmmaker. He's got about twenty movies under his belt, and he he's an independent filmmaker. He makes his, his first movie was made for five grand. He licensed it out for I think I th no he made uh, on it oh uh, god I think he made like fifty grand off that uh, selling DVDs, and he he was such a bad filmmaker at the beginning. He said that the entire movie was a wide shot. He, he just didn't know any better. So it was wide shot. Like, so when he gave it to the editor, the editor's like, where's the coverage? He's like, what's coverage? Like he had no idea. Yeah. So the whole movie the was mass. wide shots. <laughs> it was all, it was basically a play. The whole movie was a play, but he was able to hustle it by, because why his niche audience was African American stories. He was doing the Tyler Perry thing. And there was a, a hole in that marketplace. So you should look for future movies. What is, in your marketplace, your local marketplace, that is missing. What kind of cinema would people really be interested in your local? Could you tell stories about Buffalo, you know, that no, like it's something that's so unique about your town that your local audience would go crazy for because it's never, no one's ever really done. Look what, um, look what Kevin Smith did for New Jersey, you know, like, yeah, everybody yeah, knows. I read, because he did something, and he obviously, you know, took it off to another level. Sure. But locally, everyone supports him because he's promoted it so heavily. Well, that's what, I mean, that's really what we're, we're trying. So we're in Rochester, which is an hour east of Buffalo. And okay. Buffalo's a rival, like we're rivals in the film community. Like a, a lot of the guys that I work with, their crew, they all go to Buffalo to work because that's where all the work is. Buffalo and Syracuse are on fire right now with films. There's people coming from everywhere to shoot movies. And they come to, to Rochester every once in a while. But for the most part, everybody's going to, you know, east or west of us. And so, so then do something for Rochester. Right. Do and that's, that's, for Rochester. that's our whole thing is like we're, you know, a lot of the references in the script are Rochester references. We're trying to like – I'm trying to give ca cameos to local, um, you know, celebrities – yeah, good. Like that, people that I have connections with and be like, you know, come in and just be the janitor and go by like that. People get a kick out of it, you know? So then, so if then in a Rochester film, you should, then you should absolutely market it as a Rochester film. You should actually say bottom feeders, something Rochester. Even if it's just the local screenings of it and the local thing, once you get it out into a larger market, you could just call it bottom feeders. But when you, when you're marketing it, to your local community, put Rochester in the name, put like, you know, a, a, what is it? Uh, a college comedy, a Rochester college comedy right. or something like that. That is going to make everyone want to see it because, Oh, this is a hometown movie. That's an event, man. That is the, that's the key to making this work. And if you can create a niche of, if you can create movies for five, 10, 15 grand, you create a group of people who are working with you that maybe you do partnerships with, maybe you share in the revenue with, and you start building a team around that, and you start building a regional cinema for the New York, for Rochester, then maybe that goes out into Buffalo and Syracuse and other places like that, and you create that, great. Then after that, when you put it up on Amazon Prime or other places, that's just extra stuff. But if you focus on your local community, which is, you have to, that's the blue ocean for you. Yeah. You know, you've, yeah. in the book, the Blue Ocean, Red Ocean strategy, yep. Yep. this is your Blue Ocean. Now, no, but you got no competition. No one's coming in going, I got to take over the Rochester independent film market with my indie movies. That's not a thing. So you have, it's completely yours. So you should take advantage of that and build content for that audience, for that community. And you could build a really sustainable business doing that 
after you've been able to build two, three, four of these movies like this, then you can kind of start growing. Then, and then once your name starts getting bigger and bigger and your reputation becomes bigger and bigger in town, it'll be easier and easier to make these movies. And, and you'll be able to start figuring things out. You'll be able to bring in people locally a lot easier. And anybody you get in, any of these local celebrities that you're getting in, leverage all of their social media, leverage all of their email list and go, oh, look, can you give a blast out? Hey, do you want to do this? Hey, can you do a signing? There's just so many ways that you can make money with this film, uh, but you just have to be really smart about it. So I would change the marketing it and make it really Rochester heavy and focus because at the budget you're talking about, that local community can definitely support that. If this yeah. was a half million, million dollar budget film, I'd be like, that's probably not gonna work. Yeah. But at the budget that you're talking about, dude, uh, the, guy, the, the guy that's in the, one of the case studies I did, um, Delius, uh, Dalius, Delius, um, with that movie Pillhead, he made like 35 grand on the theatrical alone. You know, and then he dead started selling t-shirts. And then he said, and, and he started selling other things and then he started making money on online. And then it was just, it grew from there. So it's definitely doable. And that's a much smaller town than what you, I mean, yours a much bigger town. Rochester is a much bigger city than where he's living. So you should really look into that. That would be my, my film entrepreneurial advice as a consultant here for you, sir. Hell yeah. And that, and that's worth every dime that I just paid you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do appreciate it. And it makes me feel better because I know we're on the right track because that's kind of where we're heading, but you did give me some, some good ideas. Um, wrapping things up. What's up. What's in the near future for you? Well, of course, uh, the book film entrepreneur rise of the film entrepreneur. It is available, uh, on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, audiobook, paperback and ebook. If you want to get the audiobook for free, all you've got to do is go to www.freefilmbook.com, sign up for the book, uh, sign up for their 30 day free trial, and then you could just download the book for free. I get paid either way. And the reason, I, and that's a, film, that's a side hustle. So I, I, I've, taught, I've taught that little side hustle to authors, and they're like, oh my God. I'm like, yeah, I get a commission when you sign up for free, and I also get a commission from the book that I'm selling. So it's a good way of supporting me and supporting what I'm trying to do, but it also gets you access to the book for free if you, if you don't want to pay for it. I know a lot of people who listen to the audiobook and then go and buy the paperback so they can start making notes. Yeah, that's, that's where'd you go? Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the response I've been getting is that it's become, um, uh, uh, it's become a manual for a lot of people. People are just like, I got to go back and redline stuff. Yeah, you know, I was thinking that same thing, and that's the that's the down the the downfall with the, or the drawback to the the audio book is I listen to it and I'm like, oh, I, you know, and I'm 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 this is this is funny. I'm driving in my car and I want to record with my phone something you're saying on on in the audio book, but I'm listening to it through the Bluetooth in my car. So when I go into the audio recording app, it takes over the speakers and I can't record anything. So I'm like, ah, and I'm like driving off into the snowbank, and so yeah, I, I get the hard copy, get the get the book. You can write your notes in there. That's that's a much better and safer idea. I agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> and then the, to get the book, you can go to uh, filmbizbook.com. That's filmbizbook.com. It's associated with a full website, filmtrepreneur.com, and the podcast, uh, where a lot of these case studies that I have in the book are on the podcast, so you can actually get. Um, get listen to full hour long conversations on how these filmmakers apply the film entrepreneur method as well. My new movie's coming out uh, October, um, January 21st, 2020, a few days before Sundance, uh, poetically enough. <laughs> and uh, it will be available, like I said earlier, on Amazon, Apple TV, and exclusively on IFHTV with uh, director commentary and a lot more special edition bonus stuff. Uh, IndieFilmHustle.com is where you can find everything and anything about me, about what I do. Uh, Bulletproof screenwriting is there as well if you want to be information about screenwriting. And uh, Indie Film Hustle TV, uh, as, as you are a member, I am, I'm putting a lot of uh, energy in the new year. Uh, IFH TV is going to become, and it is already, it's already got, I think, over a thousand hours of content 
uh, a lot of educational content. It's, I want it to become streaming real world film education. That's kind of what I'm tagging it. It's, it's going to be streaming real world education. So uh, you can, you'll be able to uh, have access to it everywhere. Apple TV, um, Roku, uh, and on your apps, iPhone and Android as well. So that's uh, ifhtv.com or indiefilmhustle.tv. Now you are a, you are a, pro, a a pirate and a and a pioneer a hustler, sir. A blaze, uh, a, I, a trailblazer. That's what I was looking for. I I I, I, I try. I look look. I I, I try doing it. People don't like that too much. <laughs> I I, uh, I try I try to help my community as much as possible, and um, I I I just. I wrote film, The Rise of the Film Entrepreneur because I think it's something that needed to be written. There is nothing else like it uh, on the marketplace. No one's ever written anything like this, especially targeted to work towards filmmakers. It's basically what I did with Broken, my first short film, where I created arguably, I think, one of the first guerrilla film schools that was sold on a DVD yeah. back in 2005 when nobody was uh, teaching filmmakers how to make films at an independent level. If you, by the way, you can look on, on YouTube. I looked it up the other day. If you type in broken in my name, there's, there's 13 year, 14 year old uh, behind the scene tutorials still up on YouTube. Still up on YouTube. So I, I still have the, I, I think I was the first guy up on YouTube who did that. <laughs> there's, there's I, just, there was, it had to be. I, I, if I could, if I would have kept going, I would own. Like, can you imagine if I would have created a brand in 2005 and just oh. kept pumping out oh hey God. You're doing it now you're doing it now yeah, yeah i know I'm, I'm doing it now it's it's <laughs> it took me 10 years to come back to it but um and well, also i'm working on and the last thing i'm working on uh, the audiobook version of shooting for the mob uh, which yeah. is the first my first book about how i almost made a 20 million dollar movie for the mafia <laughs> i'm looking forward to that one forget about it um forget about it so so uh maybe Maybe if you end up doing a, a, a another like an edition to a second edition for Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, maybe you could use uh, you might be able to use bottom feeders as a case study uh, for, the, for how do you pull it out? Like how do you change switch uh, you know switch your your what's the word I'm looking for? Gears, your gears, sir. You switch, switch and scat. Jesus, hello. Stra strategy, strategy. 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 Midway through the uh, midway through the production process, so you know it's funny. It's funny. You're the second filmmaker who said that to me. Now that they've contacted me, like I'm doing the film trip method. I want to be your. I want to be a case study of your next book, because I just pulled case studies from people I knew, and uh, I think they're going to get a lot of attention in the book. The book's selling really well, and it's oh, nice. growing. Yeah, nice. It's good. I there's no question. I'm going to do a second. I'm not sure if I'll do a second edition. I just might do a second book. Right. Um, cause if you, if you, if you study Gary V, Gary V did crush it, which is, this is a this is my equivalent to crush it, uh, meaning in my business. And then he did another one called crushing it, yeah, that's which was basically a lot of, yeah, a lot of case study, a yeah. lot of case studies about people implementing his, his, uh, crush it mentality. And, uh, I think I'll probably do that as well. And it, it, it won't be the next book but it'll be probably one of the next two or three books that I do. So I, I, I think it needs to be out there. I need, I need to, to kind of jump on to this uh, as well. So. And then we got to get you to Rochester one of these days. Hopefully we'll make that happen. You let me look, dude, you know, <laughs> talk, to, talk to the film commission. I'm, well, I'm, I'm game. Honestly, honestly, I'm, I'm going to look at bringing you out myself and just cutting out the middleman and just, we'll figure it out between the two of us. Um, with my company and with the people that I work with, it's probably mm -hmm. better that way. You know, okay. when, you get, when you get a government agency involved in anything, there's too much red, it gets, it, too much, you know, as, as love them to death as much as they do for our, our little community and, and the filmmaking community. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make, we'll work, we'll work something out in 2020, man. We'll, we'll figure yeah. something out. Uh, Merry Christmas, happy holidays, happy new year. Congratulations on the book, the audio book. The streaming service, the movies, the empire, <laughs> the Yoda. I mean, you got it all. I'm, I, 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 listen, man, I'm just, I'm, I'm just a humble hustler trying to make it through the day, brother. <laughs> I love it. Hey, it's been a pleasure, um, and we'll catch up soon. All right, man. Thanks, Ed. Alex Ferrari, it's been great talking to you.